Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this Global Early Adolescent Study webinar when we're going to share some perspectives of young people in the era of COVID. My name is Caroline Moreau, and I'm an associate professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, and I'm the research director of the Global Early Adolescent Study. I'm very, very pleased to welcome four presenters today, uh, starting with Mama Lee, who is a research analyst uh, at the Johns Hopkins uh, University, and she will provide a cross-site overview of young people's relational educational experiences during COVID, as well as the impact of COVID on their health and well-being. We will then turn uh, to three panelists who will provide specific perspectives from their uh, country uh, specific. And we will start with Shunyan Yu, who is a uh, senior researcher at the Shanghai Institute of Planned Parent uh, Research. And she leads the Global Early Adolescent Study in uh, Shanghai. We will then turn to Dr. Eric Mafuta, who is an associate professor in the uh, University of Kinshasa and leads the study in the DRC. And then we'll turn it to Christian Minkelson, who's a professor at the University of Ghent and leads the Global Early Adolescent Study in um, Belgium. We will then have the opportunity to have a Q&A session. And finally, we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Chandra Mouly, uh, who's an adolescent expert in the Department of Reproductive Health and Research at the World Health Organization, who will provide concluding remarks. So I welcome all of you to post your questions in the Q&A so that we have an opportunity uh, to answer and have a discussion at the end of the present presentations. Now, before uh, we start, I want to say a few words of context about the Global Early Adolescent Study, which is a multi-site uh, study exploring gender socialization and adolescent health and well-being. And this is a multi-site uh, study that is uh, ongoing in 11 cities across five continents and focuses on urban poor adolescents. They're enrolled in the ages of 10 to 14 years. And this is a panel study, so they are uh, tracked over time. So in the spring of 2020, we took the opportunity to um, use the Global Early Adolescent Study platform to better explore young people's experiences in the time of COVID uh, through both qualitative and quantitative research. And I, uh, this is an ongoing research and we're providing here results from um, the initial stage of this, um, this study. And I will now turn it to Momo Lee, who will share the cross-site perspectives. Thank you, Caroline. I hope everyone can see my shared screen. Great, thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for the introduction. And also thank you everyone here joining us today. We are very delighted to share with you our findings on young people's experience in the era of COVID. And the results were summarized based on adolescents from multiple cities in five countries. At the beginning, I want to give you very brief context regarding the GES COVID study. The COVID study is embedded in the multi-site GES study, exploring how gender norms evolve over adolescence and how they inform the health and well-being from the early to the older adolescent years. Starting in June 2020, we used the GES platform to collect the qualitative and also quantitative information on young people's experience in the era of COVID, focusing on their attitudes, knowledge, and the behaviors related to COVID-19, and to understand how the pandemic affect young people's education, economic situation, as well as the health and the well-being. The study used a mixed method design, including a quantitative survey, as well as focus group discussions. The data I will be presenting today focus on six sites that conduct interviews between June 2020 and January 2021, 
with a sample size ranging from 382 in Kinshasa to 621 in Shanghai. The samples were drawn from the GES panels with eligi uh, eligibility criteria applied. In some sites, the criteria will be 13 years or older, but in other sites, the access to a computer or smartphone was required. Um, with the person with the size with in-person data collection, the interviews were conducted in school, whereas for sites, two, two sites in Indonesia and also cities in Belgium, data were collected remotely. All adolescents gave the assent and their parents gave the consent to participate in the study. The GES is conducted in the diverse cultural setting, but all include adolescents from the urban poor communities. At the time of the interview, most or adolescents from Shanghai and Black Tire were back in school, but only slightly over 50% for cities in Belgium and about 40% of adolescents from Kinshasa were back to school, despite uh, the school has reopened at that time. The mean age of our study population is very comparable across sites from 3.4 years in Blantyre up to 14.9 in Belgium. And our study participants were evenly distributed by sex. However, the family structure varied substantially across sites and for adolescents from two African countries were least likely to live in with the both parents versus for those from Shanghai were least likely to have siblings at home. As mentioned earlier, uh, the eligibility to have access to electronic devices was applied in some sites for study recruitment. However, the composition of our study participant was not skewed by the privileged adolescents with respect to their ownership to the electronic devices, as evidenced by the last row in this table with the percentage of about 15% up to one third of adolescents across each site were actually coming from the lowest family wealth. Now I'm turning to the survey results. I will start from the young people's attitude, knowledge, and their preventive practice regarding COVID-19. Adolescents were asked four questions regarding their concerns with the pandemic, which was summarized into a scale with mean score ranging from zero to four and a higher score indicating greater level of concerns. Almost across all the sites, the concerns were significant, with the mean score around 2.5 and higher in most of sites, except for those in Belgium. And the consistently cross, girls expressed a greater level of concerns than boys. Also, uh, adolescents were asked a series of questions about their knowledge regarding viral prevention and also their preventative behaviors. The, uh, the total number of correct answers to the knowledge question ranging from zero to seven, as illustrated in the graph on the left, the level of knowledge were quite high in Shanghai and the cities in Belgium, but there is a great variability across the sites. However, this high level of knowledge do not necessarily translate into actual preventive behaviors. As indicated in the graph on the right, we see the biggest uh, gap between the knowledge and the behaviors were noticed in Belgium. More generally, adolescents from three Asian sites were more compliant with those measures. Uh, however, the least of the adolescents from Kinshasa were able to doing so. Although we noticed the very little difference in the level of knowledge between boys and girls, we do observe a gender gap for adolescents from two sides in Indonesia, where girls are more compliant with those measures than boys. The quality of findings also endorse the gap between high level of the knowledge and the inconsistent preventive behaviors among adolescents. For example, uh, adolescents are reporting they facing some structural barriers in terms to be adherence to those pr protective measures. For example, one girl from, uh, from Kinshasa expressed the frustration regarding the mandatory 
mask wearing, especially with the enforcement, uh, with police reinforcement. And also a girl from Antwerp mentioned very little space in school, which made it very difficult for her to keep distance, social distance with peers. Next, I'm turning to the young people's perspective around the COVID impact on their social, uh, on their economic status, education, educational prospects, and the social impact really on relationships. We see a very high level of economic loss and the food insecurity among adolescents globally during this pandemic. And these hardships are very profound in two African countries. And the food insecurity were least in Shanghai and cities in Belgium. And the, uh, the gender difference was not consistent across sites. For example, uh, on the graph on the left, we notice more boys from Shanghai and also cities in Belgium reporting this greater level of economic loss. And on the right, we also notice boys from Shanghai and those from Samarang reporting the greater level of food insecurity. However, in Blantyre, girls reporting greater level of economic loss as well as greater encounters of food insecurities at home. The, uh, the concerns surrounding academic performance are, are also very high cross site, but also varied substantially. More generally, adolescents from two sites in Indonesia and those from Blantyre express the highest level of the concerns and the, the, uh, the level of the lowest were observed in Belgium. For both girls from Shanghai and those from Belgium uh, express the greater concerns than boys. However, the level of concerns does not necessarily match well onto how adolescents perceive the COVID impact would, uh, uh, would alter their educational plans. Most of the adolescents do not consider COVID would alter their educational plan. However, a small proportion of adolescents from all the sites indicate COVID actually altered their educational plans as illustrated in the graph on the right. More generally, girls indicating they were likely to completing more school rather than less as a result of COVID. Boy, on the other hand, indicating they are likely to complete less rather than more school. And uh, what we found here is striking in, is for adolescents from Kinshasa, for uh, a higher proportion of both boys and the girls consistently indicating they were likely to completing less school. And we also observe a widest gender gap here with nearly 49% of boys versus 20% of girls indicating they were likely to, to, to do so. The quality of findings reveals that uh, the, uh, the concerns related to school were actually uh, comes from some difficulty with remote learning. Most of the adolescents indicating the remote learning is not as effective as in school learning setting. As a consequence, their school performance has declined. However, some adolescents also noticed some positive aspect regarding the remote learning, including the increased flexibility in their daily schedule, as well as having more time to sleep. Next, we are look at some results regarding peer socialization around COVID uh, time. In uh, adolescents reporting on how they interact with their friends during the COVID. Uh, we reporting on the proportion of adolescents interact with friends in, in person for at least three to four times a week as illustrated in the graph on the left. Whereas the graph on the right, we are reporting on the proportion of adolescents keep contacts with their friends through social media platform during the pandemic. And what we see here, the patterns are very different across sites. More generally, for adolescents from all three sites in Asia and those from cities in Belgium are more likely to use a social media platform to interact with their friends. And the opposite was true for those from two African sites. And we moving back to the graph on the left, 
and we see here, boys are more likely to prefer uh, hang out with the friends in in-person setting than girls um, in most of the sites, except for those from cities in Belgium. And the, the in-person types of the interaction was most popular in Blantyre and was the least popular in Shanghai, despite at that time, school has reopened already. In the last segment of this presentation, I, will, I would like to share some findings on the adolescent perspective on their overall health and the mental health. And comparing those indicators to pre-COVID time points when we have the data on those indicators in a prior GES weeks. Uh, adolescents were asked to self-rated their overall health before the COVID kicked in, which indicated that the green bar on this graph and they were asked to assess themselves again at, during the COVID interview as indicated by the pink bar on the graph. And in general, the picture was indicating uh, from adolescents consistently across all the sites, they were considering themselves in good or excellent health conditions during the pandemic. And the boys systematically reading they have a better health than girls across all sites, except for those from cities in Belgium. And another key message from this graph is uh, for all the adolescents from Kinshasa and the Belgium, we see the slightly decrease in the overall health over time. And the sharpest decrease was noticed among girls from Denpasar. On the other hand, we also noticed a slightly improvement in this health uh, over time among adolescents. This is, is true for all boys from three Asian sites and also girls from Shanghai. At the same time, we also evaluated two indicators surrounding mental health, including depressive symptomology and a generalized anxiety disorder. Here, I will focus on the anxiety and the showing you the level of anxiety during COVID pandemic for adolescents across the sites on the left. And what we see here, the level of anxiety are very profound cross sites and the systematically higher among girls than boys. And this level was particularly high for girls uh, from cities in Belgium. And moving on to the graph on the right, which is showing the level of change in the anxiety during the pandemic over time. And what we see here is for boys and girls alike from uh, Kinshasa, the level has been increasing over time, comparing the COVID period to the pre-COVID period. And this observation was only true for girls from Shanghai. The qualitative findings also um, pro, uh, provide us additional insight regarding how adolescents emotionally react to the COVID. Both boys and girls alike, um, uh, they mentioned their mental stress at the beginning of this pandemic and how the life has been very difficult and also the adaptation to the pandemic and the socialization has been uh, uh, very challenging for adolescents globally. And uh, for example, one voice from Gant mentioned, uh, he sometimes uh, experienced mental breakdowns and then he suddenly feels very bad. And in the, uh, in the same time, uh, the most change that took the biggest toll on the adolescent lives has been not being able to interact with their peers in, in person, which also indicating that online interaction does not necessarily provide the same level of comfort to adolescents during the pandemic. So lastly, I would like to take the opportunity to highlight three takeaway messages to help conclude my presentation today. So the first one will centers on adolescents' COVID knowledge and their behaviors. Although they're all very aware of, our, uh, aware of the viral uh, transmission and the method of prevention, some of the adolescents find it's quite difficult or challenging to be very compliant with those measures, uh, especially under some structural barriers. The next important message reveals that COVID indeed has greatly impacted uh, young people's lives from multiple angles, 
including the economic situations, school performance, and the socialization with the peers. Um, and the impact of education uh, um, were most profound for adolescents from Kinshasa. Lastly, the message centers on mental health. Um, the forced adaptation to the uh, social isolation and those challenges surrounding education are really uh, incited very heightened level of anxiety among adolescents. This is especially true for girls, although some adolescents reporting slightly improved overall health during the pandemic. Thank you very much today for your attention and interest in our study. Thank you, Momo. And uh, now I will pass it on to Shunyan Yu, who will provide specific perspectives from Shanghai. Hi, I'm Chenyan Yu from Shanghai Institute of Planned Parenthood Research. And our team has been working with the uh, uh, Johns Hopkins University and the Global Early Adolescent uh, Study Group for a long time. And our study sample of COVID module is uh, uh, nested in the GEAS follow-up and the participants were all uh, middle school students uh, in grade eight and nine. So um, cutting to the chase and uh, echo what just a moment presented that there seems to there seems to be a, a uh, uh, increase in the overall health among adolescents in Shanghai during the COVID period compared with previous uh, follow-up. And at first, we actually was curious about the reason behind it. Later, uh, we thought it might be caused during the time youth were required to stay at home. And staying at home is relatively safe for adolescents. Uh, it does not only uh, prevent use from COVID, but also from other infectious disease like flu and, and chickpox and other, other diseases. And for adolescents from Shanghai sites, the mental health of uh, um, boys uh, did not get worse comparing to the previous follow-up. We saw it might also because the uh, pressure brought by the COVID spread was less than the pressure uh, brought by the study during the pre-COVID time, which was relieved in the COVID period. Um, from the qualitative study, we did find some evidences which could support our assumption. Uh, for example, during the focus group, boys emphasized that, that the ease of online classes compared to in-person classes. They said we had more free time than before and we, um, we uh, would, uh, could do what things we like, such as playing games, chasing drama, and so on. And also both boys and girls talked about the flexibility and less commuting time and more sleep allowed by the online classes. And you have enough time to rest and as, long as, uh, as long as you finish your homework quickly, whereas you might do your homework for a long time in the past so that you didn't have enough time to sleep and you would always feel tired when you got up in the morning. And indeed, we saw this data survey data that youth um, got adequate sleeping time during COVID period. And Adelson also noted other benefits of online classes, such as uh, um, being uh, able to replay classes of less homework and could, uh, could did not take notes and could just take a picture of the key points, which is more convenient and comfortable. And all the above might explain the improvement of health, overall health uh, among youth in Shanghai. And apart from this, I'd like to reflect on another point is how the youth cope with the stress. Generally, uh, youth in the focus group talked about lots of ways to relieve stress, both interpersonal and interpersonal. However, for most of the time, uh, uh, you uh, talked about uh, relieving this just uh, relying on them uh, on themselves. A girl said we should adjust our mentality first, uh, be optimistic, and don't think too much. And boys talked about setting a goal for yourself and uh, 
and just to ignore the stressor as a stressor we're essentially getting over. And commu communicating or comparing with friends is an essential interpersonal support to cope with the stress during COVID. A girl who was anxious about her grade when learning from home um, said, I would find my good friend to help me. And I felt better when I heard that she also did not study much. And uh, another young girl also talked about that they could get organizational help uh, from psychological teachers that they had this psychological counseling class once a week. And generally for the uh, interpersonal uh, support, we consistently find that a few adolescents sought this psychological support during COVID-19 period and most rely on talking to parents or friends rather than professionals. And we saw this gender disparity among boys and girls. Girls tend to discuss the interpersonal coping strategies that they used more than boys. And um, for these gender disparities, we saw uh, it could be related to the gender norms that require boys to show their power by hiding their weakness, or just simply because that boys have less mental health issues during this time than uh, girls. Next step, we would uh, do further analysis to verify our thoughts. And basically, we call for some inputs to make youth more willing to seek help from outside when they feel stressed. Just don't keep the uh, uh, depressed and the anxiety thoughts to themselves. These are all my reflections, and I'll stop here and give my mic back to Caroline. Thank you, Xunyan. Um, thank you very much. And we will travel the world from Shanghai to Kinshasa and hear uh, Eric's reflections on young people's experience in Kinshasa. Eric, you have the mic. Thank you, Caroline. Um, from Kinshasa perspective, um, okay, I've just I've like just to to um, in some uh, our of our results. First, uh, we noticed that um, even though uh, our adolescents have uh, some knowledge of uh, the disease and uh, the prevention method, but they always not translate in practice. They don't practice to, to wear a mask, to stay at home, and uh, to wash hands every time as it was uh, recommended, simply because uh, for them, they don't perceive the COVID problem as a problem because they don't have cases in their community, uh, even though they have information from states, radios, and TV, but they have no they perceive no cases in the community. So for them, it's not a problem. It's why they cannot or not practice uh, what was mandatory. And uh, the second problem we found also, we have uh, the COVID affects, they come of uh, a lot of uh, households in Kinshasa. As you know, during the, uh, the first phase or the second phase of COVID, there was uh, some restriction of movements and uh, the lockdown of the business part of the Kinshasa. So most of the parents uh, do not go to, to work and uh, the, the household experience the reduction of their income and it results from uh, food insecurity. And this was highlighted by a participant in this study. We have also um, the problem of school and the school was uh, were closed, and uh, this, the government tried to make uh, in place a remote education program. But most of the, the program was just uh, senses, and there was not vocational for girls. They have they like uh, vocational courses, though, so they have not this. And uh, most of municipality of Kinshasa experience a problem of electricity, so they don't access to most of the program or session that was uh, broadcast by this uh, remote education program. And this uh, explains why, why uh, um, adolescents say that they will uh, complete less education during the pandemic because they have no courses. And uh, as you know, the state uh, 
tried to just to make very short uh, school program. So they have not a lot of uh, information or a lot of topics comparing the, what was uh, planned for the year. In the COVID, most of the, the, the adolescents experience problem because they have, uh, every time they are, they are scared of uh, getting uh, bad news, they are scared of, of uh, even though they have not case, but they are experience this fear of a problem. They have no uh, food to eat, they cannot move. So this affects their mental health. So it's why they are experiencing a lot of anxiety in Kinshasa. It's what I can say in summary about uh, the Kinshasa perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. And now we will turn to Europe and hear more about uh, young people's experience in Belgium. Christian, you have the mic. Thanks so much, Caroline. Um, is my presentation showing up well? Perfect, thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Um, it's my pleasure to present the first results from Belgian Flanders, actually, which is the northern part of Belgium. And we decided to focus on uh, mental health for this presentation, in particular because you could also see in the initial presentation that uh, we stood out uh, quite a bit when it comes to, to mental health and not, not in uh, the good sense. So these are a few of the, the first um, further analysis uh, with this regard uh, from our side. Uh, we analyzed data from about 440 participants and we focused on, well, for this analysis, analysis we included three measures of uh, mental health, indicators of mental health. Uh, it's depression, body image, and anxiety. And depression is maybe not the best term. It's more depressive symptoms, not uh, clinical depression. And from this graph, we can see a few things. Uh, first of all, we see that girls score significantly worse than boys in both waves. Um, so we see, for example, if we compare depressive symptoms in wave one among boys, uh, if you look at the blue lines, uh, girls score, score way higher. The same for body image and also for anxiety, which was also only measured in wave two. And the second thing that we can derive from this chart is that there's a significant increase in poor mental health. So the higher the bar, the, the poorer the mental health status. Uh, in between the two ways, these uh, mental health uh, actually worsened significantly, both for boys and girls. Uh, we dug a bit deeper and, and looked at what could be associated uh, with poor mental health during COVID among boys and girls on our site. And on the, in terms of the quantitative data, uh, there were a few things that were um, strongly associated with uh, these, these scales. So if we look at anxiety and body image, there were three factors or four factors actually strongly associated with this. this we see that girls um, score worse on anxiety and body image. We also see that uh, adolescents who use more social media have worse scores on anxiety and also on body image. The, the more they worry about corona, the worse their scores also are on anxiety and body image. And then the last factor, which is really important, is uh, school. School and stress worries about school was associated with all the um, mental health indicators, basically. And this was also confirmed uh, very strongly in our uh, quantitative, uh, qualitative data. So we did four focus group discussions. Uh, two of them were in October and two of them were in March. And um, especially during the, the focus groups in March, we, we noticed that school uh, took up a really important place in, in uh, determining the mental health uh, of young people. So we, we asked what is, the big, what is your biggest concern currently? What stresses you out the most? And, and the full focus group basically just screamed uh, school. Uh, so school is stressing them out a lot. Um, so just to give you a quote, everything comes together. You have so many life lessons, so many tasks, so many. And then you have the next day or half a day of school. And then you have another test and then another task. And everything is just so complicated. Um, and just to give you some background, uh, the current situation in Belgium is that uh, students this age uh, get to go to school part-time, so they have part-time classes uh, online and part-time classes in school. And schools determine themselves how they divide this time. So some students would go uh, one week to class and then would, would, would stay at home for one week. Other schools do it day by day, uh, so there's different systems. 
Uh, but this is a very, very stressful factor for the young people. There's other stressors that determine their mental health. Um, there's uh, following the news uh, that's giving young people stress. There's a constant change in COVID measures. And this may be really particular to the Belgian situation because um, this, yeah, measures just change a lot um, in Belgium. For example, I'll, I'll read this quote. We need more clarity and don't give us such false hope because it's like lockdown, no lockdown, then back in lockdown, then no lockdown, then back in lockdown. And then we have to adapt all the time. And I think this is also the biggest reason that everything is much more difficult. Uh, further, there's the students or, or young people report a, a lack of physical exercise um, as a reason to, for poor mental health. And also just a general negative feeling in society. I just, uh, I'll read this part of the quote that our conversations are only about how nothing in our lives is going well. Um, on the positive side, uh, there's also they also identified a few coping mechanisms uh, that uh, help them through uh, the day. And of course, friends is part of the, the coping mechanisms. Uh, psychological support as well. So there were, were a few students, uh, a few young people in the focus group discussions that did mention that they were going to psychologists, but also uh, one who mentioned that they were waiting for psychological help. They had requested it and there, there's long waiting lines. So that's also... Um, something to consider. And very important in particular for, for young boys uh, is gaming. So for many youngsters, uh, male I mean, gaming is also a way to let off steam. And it's my game hour and I will chillax and I'm here and this is the time and no one is going to take this away from me. So that was a, a quite a, a stress relieving factor for um, a particular boys. Um, so that's it from my end. Back to you, Caroline, thank you. Thank you very much and thank you to all of you. So we are going to now move on to our Q&A and I'm seeing a number of questions that are posted. So thank you very much for your um, engagement. And we'll start by a few questions, I think that relate to uh, some of the findings around uh, depression and just kind of um, some of those questions have been answered, but just to indicate that we were using scales re related to anxiety and three questions related to depression in the COVID, uh, in, in the COVID module, we didn't have a full, um, full assessment of depression because we were concerned about uh, remote data collection for young people and the inability to provide support uh, if they indicated signs of, of, of uh, disruption and, and need for services. And so um, we, we limited the number of questions related to depression in that respect. Um, there are a number of questions that relate to how depression evolves across sites and by age and specifically uh, looking at uh, if depression, uh, the differences in depression and anxiety specifically across the sites have something to do with the levels of disruptions around COVID-19 from pre-COVID period to uh, the types of restrictions that were implemented during the pandemic. And just kind of before I open it up to Momo and our panelists, I just want to emphasize that uh, the data that was collected and that was presented today spans over a pretty kind of um, wide time period because it expands from actually uh, June in Shanghai to up to uh, the later winter period in uh, in some of our sites. So quite a range, and it means that uh, young people's schooling as well as the um, piece of the pandemic was quite different uh, across those sites. But I will uh, let Momo and uh, our panelists reflect on differences in depression um, by age and other insights. Momo, do you want to start? Sure. Thank you, Caroline, for the information. Although, thank you for the question from the audience. So the mental health uh, outcomes by age is very different uh, cross sites and also um, by the age group uh, uh, and also by the outcome of the mental health indicators. For example, um, as mentioned by Caroline, the depression, uh, uh, we 
we see there is a slightly decline in the depressive symptomology over time among younger and also older adolescents. However, we do not see this level of decline are differ, systematically different between these two age group. And going on to the anxiety level, so we also see very inconsistent findings regarding the level of anxiety over time cross sites. For example, in Shanghai, we see the level increased for older adolescents rather than for younger ones. Um, but um, the difference in terms of the increasing in the level of anxiety was not observed for those from uh, Contrasta by the different age group. Thank you. Maybe I'll turn it to Christian because uh, that's where we see uh, a rise in anxiety and striking for young girls, can you speak a little bit about the context of, of when the data was collected in Belgium and the, level, the levels of restrictions that were in place relative to the pre-COVID period where obviously young people had a lot more mobility and uh, opportunities to interact? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for, for that question. Um, maybe first of all, we see an increase in anxiety in all the, in all the mental health scales, um, as, as you could see in the presentation. At the same time, we have nothing to compare it to. Eh? So that, that's something we have to keep in the back of our minds. We, we, have, we don't have the, the data from Belgium. We cannot compare it to a non-COVID situation. So we don't know whether it's related to, to COVID, though uh, from the, the qualitative data, it does seem to be so. Um, Belgium is quite an open society. Our children get quite a lot of freedom, uh, do lots of um, hobbies, extracurricular activities, oftentimes have freedom to, to move around quite freely um, in normal times. Um, and of course, all of a sudden, this was, um, this was ended mid-March last year. Um, we collected the data, uh, the quantitative data in December, January, where we were uh, at the end of a second uh, wave, a uh, very big second wave in Belgium. I think we had one of the, the biggest waves uh, worldwide. Um, and the qualitative data was collected in uh, October and in March. And we do see uh, a big difference between these two, uh, these two time periods in the, in the qualitative data. When we were talking to the people in October, they were still hopeful. It was before we entered into additional restrictions for a second wave. Um, they, they were quite optimistic. School had just restarted and, and it, was, it was manageable. They were coping, I had the feeling. When we did the focus group discussions in, in March, uh, to be honest, I was, uh, I was heartbroken after the, the, the focus group discussions. I, I was really uh, sad, when, especially when we did the, the talk with girls. Um, they are suffering a lot. Um, and and the, the context that we were in at that point is that schools had been partially, uh, they, were at, they were able to go to school part time um, since October, so that was already months that was going on. They had uh, the perspective that schools could possibly open up fully a few weeks later. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, they had no perspective. They, they honestly, they they are suffering a lot. And the school stress, stress I think it's. Um, I don't know if it's worse than in other uh, countries. I'd, I'd like to hear from the other <laughs> from the other panelists actually. Uh, but the, this was definitely the main uh, the main factor for them. Thank you, Christian. Um, there are a few questions that are pertain to educational attainment. I think a number of people were straightened by um, increases in dropouts. Um, and what are we expecting this to result in an increase in child labor or child marriage? Uh, and uh, so maybe I should turn this to Eric because Kinshasa is specifically affected by this phenomenon. Thank you, Caroline. I don't think so, because uh, when we are talking about COVID, in this specific time, there was a um, um, close of schools, so um, people was uh, at home. So there was no problem about uh, child uh, work or child marriage. But what we can, what we have was uh, some uh, violence, domestic violence, but no child marriage. Because even in DRC, the child marriage is not allowed. So it was not uh, a concern for us. 
I have another question about uh, to relate uh, the difference on education to insecurity. Okay, in Kinshasa, we have not a problem of insecurity. So it's not uh, a factor that we can uh, highlight in this uh, discussion. Most of the problem about education in Kinshasa in, during this period are related to the remote education and the close of schools. Great, thank you, Eric. And, and, and what do you think uh, explains this gender difference between the boys and the girls perspectives around completing more education because it seems like it's it's a phenomenon that is affecting boys more than girls do, do you have any insights on that i think that it was just the the answer i tried to to figure out myself what can explain this um in drc what we notice in that uh, boys don't like, I can say, don't like studying. So uh, in contrast, girls think that uh, study was, is a, a big weight of uh, taking opportunity. So for them, they are trying to, to get opportunity or to study. And uh, relating to, to economic constraints, most of parents try to to direct them um, to vocational uh, studies. So I think that it's just a problem of, uh, of choice or perception. There is no uh, evidence to that. Thank you, Eric. So I'm seeing a few questions that relate to sexual and reproductive health as well as sexual identity. Um, and those questions were not uh, included in the COVID specific module, but we do have questions uh, in the Global Early Adolescent Study, both pre-COVID, and this is an ongoing study. And so we will have more information related to uh, young people's trajectories uh, and specific trajectories for um, uh, gender uh, minorities. Uh, and, and questions related to gender minorities are not included in all sites. Uh, and that depends very much on IRB, as well as kind of the legal framework around that. Um, so we don't have specific information related to access to contraception. Uh, however, we will be able to respond to some concerns related to how COVID disruptions and specifically disruptions related to relationships might affect longer term sexual relationships as well as access to services. Um, I'd like to now turn uh, to questions that relate to other dimensions of health. And one question relates to actually, uh, do we have any information about obesity or physical health? So maybe I want to turn this to Shunyan because in China specifically, there were uh, a number of questions that were included that were specific to uh, young people's nutrition as well as their sleeping patterns. So, Shunyan, would you like to uh, respond? Of course, and um, we do uh, in, in implemented uh, several questions um, in our uh, follow-ups of COVID, uh, COVID uh, of the COVID module in about the uh, nutrition and the activity. Actually, uh, in our uh, round one uh, data, we also see that the uh, the general um, and activity time for boys and girls have uh, big gender differences. And boys uh, reported, even in the uh, COVID quarantine time, boys reported more time than girls, about uh, 1.4 hours uh, per, per day uh, versus uh, 0.9 hours per day for boys and girls respectively. So uh, we also uh, followed up this uh, uh, items on the round two, but um, for both boys and girls, and as the COVID uh, quarantine got loose, and so they both got, got, got some increase, but still boys more than girls. And for the uh, nutrition, 
And we actually asked in the round two, but we don't see uh, so many uh, malnutrition, uh, the, the percentage of malnutrition is, is not so much in our side. So uh, that's the uh, situation in our side. Thank you. Thank you, Shenyan. And I remember vividly that the qualitative study, the initial focus groups came out pretty strongly around young people's concerns about uh, their nutrition during, during the lockdown and uh, taking too much food. And they were concerned, particularly girls were concerned about their weight, which was a, an, interesting, uh, an interesting finding. Um, so let me now turn to questions. Um, uh, let's see. Um, one question relates to uh, how young people themselves were invested and engaged in this research uh, uh, at the time of COVID or more generally, how are young people themselves invested in the global early adolescent study? So maybe again, uh, I might turn it to Shunyan because just to give you an oversight is the global early adolescent study uh, is also invested in getting young people involved, not only as advisors, but as uh, and participants, obviously, but also as young researchers. And we have engaged in uh, developing advisory boards and training young people to participate and engage in the research itself. And one of those sites is Shanghai. So maybe, Shunyan, if you want to reflect on uh, youth engagement in Shanghai, uh, and how young people are uh, contributing to this research. Uh, well, we and also participate uh, and ask the youth to uh, engage the youth engagement activity with us in the uh, school activities. And those, this kind of activities does not only focus on the COVID um, aspect, but it, it was included as the uh, probably has some impacts on uh, um, adolescents' uh, uh, educational concerns. And, uh, uh, and in, in our uh, youth engagement, we um, um, let the uh, youth to, to participate in the uh, career um, and, uh, in, in induced um, pathway uh, that, that the uh, let them not just focusing on the grade, but also on the uh, skills uh, of how to uh, um, more more get suitable to the society. So uh, that's the way that we want to relieve their stress from this pers perspective, and uh, and also uh, we let this uh, student to uh, get host host the activities. They, they brought the ideas. They thought that mental health is an important part of their life and they designed their project so, so that uh, they want to know how they, um, for, for instance, the uh, uh, internet violence, how the internet violence influenced their lives and uh, they would want to uh, stop this kind of things and uh, they would uh, and, uh, cope with us and cope with the uh, psychological teachers to 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 uh, design their uh, project and and this this way that we we let the uh, uh, and we also learn from this uh, students and they are such uh, they have so many ideas and they they also inspired us on this uh, on our research. Thank you. Thank you, Shunyan. So maybe a last question to uh, let Sandra um, let Chandra have concluding remarks, but I just want to direct one last question that came out uh, several times about to your mind, and I'll start with Christian. What is the most interesting or surprising finding uh, from this first round of, of data uh, in your site? Uh, that's one of the most difficult questions. Um, I don't know if it's, if it's uh, yeah, I'll come back to the school because the, the thing is in Belgium, we have done, or the, the government has done a lot to keep schools open. I think uh, compared to our neighboring countries, schools have, have been kept open much more than, than in other. Um, but the, the, 
yeah, it, it's not adapted to the to the current situation. Uh, students are suffering a lot because they they get much more tasks than than they used to get. Um, they they don't feel well. They don't cope with the situation well. And I think it's simply not taken into account by our by our um, leaders and by the schools themselves. Um, they're not realizing that um, that this is such a heavy burden. Thank you, Christian and Chandra. I think we are at the time, and I will let you uh, propose some of your concluding remarks. Thank you, Caroline, and. Uh, greetings from the World Health Organization. Uh, congrats to the presenters from Belgium, China, uh, and the DRC. I'd like to make five points. Three points that relate to direct and indirect effects, and two points that relate to implications. Uh, firstly, the direct effects of COVID-19 on adolescents are minimal. As of 20th uh, April, Yesterday, um, there were 9,830 COVID-related deaths that Switzerland reported to WHO. Only one of them was in the 10 to 19 age group, and two of them were in the 20 to 29 age group. And as of yesterday, um, 3 million and 25,000 uh, COVID-related deaths globally were reported to WHO, and only a small minority of them um, relate to adolescents. So the direct effects are minimal. My second point is that um, studies by the Global Early Adolescent Study, but also studies by GAGE, Gender and Adolescents Global Evidence, by Rutgers and by Population Council, all point to the enormous indirect effects of COVID-19 on adolescents. Um, and effects which could be lasting and which could affect life trajectories. Many points were made in this uh, webinar. I'd just like to highlight two of them. One of them uh, is a point that Mengmen made, which was young people, um, even though they could contact um, their friends through the internet, they said that was not enough. They really wanted to see them, touch them, be with them. And the second point is Christine's point. She said, the second round of um, um, focus group discussions, interviews was heartbreaking for her. My wife is a psychiatrist. She works here in Switzerland and she tells me exactly the same thing. It's an extremely difficult situation, even in uh, uh, the wealthiest countries of the world. The third point is that COVID-19 affects all, all of us. It affects all adolescents, but clearly, those adolescents living in the poorest families and communities and those with the least power are affected much more. We heard from Eric and we heard his responses to the comments on what's happening um, in, in DRC. And what he said about DRC is true for Kenya, it's true for Uganda, it's true for India. You know, when there's no electricity, when you know you have one computer which is being shared by four people in the home, you know, having remote education uh, is only on paper. Gage has done a study in Gaza and the West Bank. Both of them are in Palestine, but Gaza, the situation is much more difficult than in the West Bank. And in every uh, negative effect, we saw the situation was worse uh, in, in, uh, in the Gaza Strip. The fourth point, and the first of my two points and implications are Periods, menstrual periods don't stop for pandemics. And neither does sex. Rutgers has just published a set of studies with a focus on sexual and reproductive health and adolescence. And in the Rutgers study, they said one in three adolescent girls or young women wanted contraception and were unable to get it. One in three of them said that they experienced sexual harassment. Now, adolescents even if they have not had sex or having co consensual sex or coerced sex desperately need services. You know, just a few weeks ago, we were running a teaching session for young people in the Royal Tropical Institute in Amsterdam. And one of the participants uh, um, identifies us, herself uh, as um, um, LGBTQI. And she was saying how difficult it was for her 
uh, to uh, to be in the house, constraint in the house with parents who are angry with her and who really don't accept it. And you're kind of stuck in that relationship. My last point, and that's a point that came through in many presentations and uh, Mengmen men mentioned it, Eric also mentioned it. We know from 40 years of work on HIV that simply telling young people or people in general what to do does not work. So what has happened with adolescents is they've been ignored, they've been neglected. All of a sudden, because they're moving around, they're being blamed, and now they're being ordered uh, to wear a mask and do hand washing and follow all the rules. So this knowledge practice gap is everywhere. Here in peaceful Switzerland, there have been riots in Sengalen and Sion by young people who are totally fed up. And you know, um, uh, you know, tightening the screw on them is just not enough. What we really need to do is studies like this to understand what people are doing, why they are doing it, and then to work with them to try to enable behaviors, recognizing that in different cultural contexts, Christine mentioned this point, in a context where people are used to much more liberties than, for example, in Singapore, um, their behaviors are going to be different. So finally, COVID-19 is a tragedy, a huge tragedy, a tragedy for all of us. But it could also be an opportunity, an opportunity for us to recognize that we have been ignoring adolescents. We have not been working with them uh, as equal partners. And we need to use good science, not just in developing vaccines, but also in working with adolescents. And we need to work with adolescents as equal partners. Thank you, Caroline, for this opportunity. And congrats to this great GEAS team. Thank you very much, Sandra. And thank you to our four presenters. Thank you all for attending and have a great day. Bye, everyone.